The other question that arises, well, what are we doing this for? Why is it that nervous systems have evolved the way they have evolved? What is the final goal? What are they doing? Well, this question borders somewhere between the metaphysical, philosophical components and the epistemological. And sometimes this is good, let's sit under a tree and read a book and look at our navel and think about why. And this is also one of the areas I think that the big stretch becomes almost eschatological. It allows us to think in these broader terms. What is the meaning of X, Y, and Z? Towards what? Why are we here? Etc. But even if we don't go there, we're forced to confront the interaction between the formal ways that biological systems work, and the brain is one of them, the material marvel of brains and nerves, and of course the mystery in many ways, at least the enigma of efficient causality. This takes us to what Chalmers has referred to as the hard question of neuroscience, simply how do brains give rise to minds? I'll leave Chalmers his question because it is in fact, I think, the keel upon which much of contemporary neuroscience balances, steers. It's also in many ways the compass that directs that ship. But this is not an esoteric question, because arising from this question is the question that I have posed repeatedly, which is, what can and perhaps should we do with the knowledge we have? And incidentally, the corollary to that is the knowledge we don't. So what this then forces us to do is to confront head on the enigma of the brain mind. This is, in fact, the human brain. It's not as big as most people think. You know, most people tend to think, well, it's huge. It takes up the entirety of the cranium. It's about that big. It fits in the palm of your hands. Yet in many ways, it's so enigmatic. It's enigmatic because it forces us to confront what we know, what we don't, and what lies in between. It brings us to the point of trying to understand how brains give rise to minds and what are the nature of these things that we call selves. What is a self? Not to be wholly neurocentric, but what is this thing? And what does it mean? Well, let's take a look at what neuroscience tells us right now. We used to have this very mechanistic approach to the brain. Part of the reason for that was it was grounded in a lot of the, the worldview that give rise after the second industrial revolution. You've heard this. The body is a fascinating machine. The brain is a wonderful machine. It's not a machine. It doesn't work like a machine. Certainly it has mechanics to it, but it's different than many machines. Because many machines are not truly complex dynamical systems in the truest sense of that word. What does contemporary neuroscience tell us right now about the way brains work? All brains, by the way. I give you three or four very important points. And there's a particular level of sophistication here that we'll walk through, for those of you who aren't neuroscientists. What we know is that the brain acts as a multi-directional hierarchical network. Things come up from the body. They enter and are integrated within nervous systems. They're then processed at various levels within brains, however complicated those brains may be. And what we then understand is that things that occur here feed back down. So it is bi-directional, and there are many different networks, and each one of them have some unique and distinct properties. We know the conscious process, the idea that there is some level that the system is working, an awareness of the system, the system being self-referential in some way, is probably what's called a point attractor. Nice way to think about this is, I mean, many of you may have seen the movie Star Wars. There's the Death Star, and what it does is something absolutely impossible. It takes a bunch of laser light, it focuses it to a point, and then directs it forward. My physicist colleagues tell me that's absolutely impossible to do, at least at this particular point in physics. But it's a really nifty thing to think about, because that is actually the way brains give rise to interiority. They give rise to the feeling of what happens, to quote Antonio Damasio. Different points in these networks have activities that summate. And what tends to happen is they come to a particular point in the space and time frame of the brain, sometimes referred to as the brain space or Hilbert space, 
and that then bubbles up to a particular level of neurological function that you then become aware of. Now a number of different theorists have called this slightly different things. The two that are probably most relevant are Gerald Edelman, the Nobel Prize winner, who refers to this as the dynamic neuronal core. Great theory, wonderful book to read. Edelman's Wider Than the Sky, I think, is a classic. Another theorist, Bernard Bars, has written in the theater of consciousness. And he refers to this particular process as the global neuronal working space. These are very compatible theoretical approaches that bring together the most contemporary neuroscientific information to help to describe and perhaps predict the ways in which neurologically biologic systems can give rise to what appear to be, appear to be emergent properties, consciousness being the main one. So if we then take the jump to go, what is mind? I want you to consider something. Think you have a brain, but you are a mind. An organism has a brain, but it is a mind. The brain exists embodied in something in that organism. It grows up with that organism. It experiences what that organism experiences. My brain, the details of my brain, are different than his, different than hers, different than yours, for sure. The devils and the deities lie in those details. The neuroscientific adage, see one brain, see one brain, tells us that what we have in common is our uniquity. Uh, a, a, simple, a simple thought exercise for you. As you can tell by this wonderful speech impediment, I'm a New Yorker. I grew up in New York City. If I say, well, ladies and gentlemen, think back to your 12th birthday. Do it. Think about that. I can tell you what I was doing on my 12th birthday. I was stealing hubcaps midtown. Now, for some of you, that may, you may go, oh, yeah, I remember doing that. For others, you go, what? Why are our memories not identical? Simple, because our experiences are non-identical. Look around the room. It's a real exercise. Look around the room. We are what's called phenotypically different. Nobody is going to mistake Laurie Kinney and I for identical twins separated at birth. She's far better looking than I am. Moreover, what we understand is that those phenotypes just don't exist for our exteriority. Our insides are phenotypically different. The connectivities are different. Experience generates those connectivities. Edelman's idea about neurons that fire together, wire together, is quite true. And let's face it, our patterns of firing are very, very different. Me stealing hubcaps as a 12-year-old created very, very different network properties than perhaps somebody who was tipping over cows in the Midwest for their 12th birthday. So what we find then is the notion of mind is in some ways derivative from our most recent computational analogies. That's not to say that the brain or the mind is a computer. It is not. But it does work in computational functioning, which is not just a nifty play on words. What it does, it's a computational moment. It's a moment in space-time that exists in this structure that is a nervous system and brain that is both retrospective, it looks backwards, and prospective. That's how nervous systems function. I match everything to template. He walks in the room, I say hello. Why? Because I'm matching what I'm seeing here to a sample that I knew before. Some of you have come up to me before the lecture and said, pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. If I meet you again, hopefully I'll remember you. Although I'm not as young as I used to be, so that gets a little iffy. But it does look backwards and then look forward. And it matches that to the present. And the present for brain minds are fleeting. And what does this really do? It matches what's going on in here to things that are going on out there. It's a wonderful survival tool, you know. Have I seen it before? Do I recognize it? Is it good, bad, or indifferent? If I have an experience with it, let's file that away and let's move on. And so I can then intuit and navigate these shifting architectonics of the world out there and from the world out there, predict, develop, create a world in here. That's what brains do qua as minds.